pleasant good evening to one and all. We thank you for joining us for another night when we study the word of God as commanded in the scripture where we ought to study to show ourselves approved unto God, work men who would not need to be ashamed but rightly dividing the word of truth. So once again, thanks for joining us here at the Prayer, Faith, and Encouragement Ministries International for our Tuesday night Bible study. Amen. Tonight we are continuing our teachings on the doctrines of the Bible, and our focus tonight is continuing to be on the word of God. But as we are preparing to move into our studies, we are going to ask our young worship singers and musicians to just lead us in a song, in a chorus. It's a well-known chorus, um, well-known well for us who grew up in the Caribbean, I'm not sure for how many other people, but it's a chorus that speaks about the Bible and the importance of the Bible. And they're going to lead us in this Sunday school chorus, after which I am going to open us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to get right into our studies for tonight. So will you welcome Grace and John as they lead us into in this chorus, the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. Amen. Grace and John. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Blessed hallelujah. Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank God. Amen. For the reminder of that Bible. Amen. Sunday school chorus. The B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. Hallelujah. Amen. There are many, many best-selling authors out there. There are many, many. Amen. Um, authors that write all types of books. My, my, one of my favorite genres is sci-fi, and you know you get excited about the books. But the book that is for me is the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, 
the B-I-B-L-E. Hallelujah. Can we approach our Father? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's just all lift our voices. Amen. Right where you are in your homes, glory be to God. Right where you are in your vehicles driving, wherever you might be, just lift your voice with me and let's begin to petition our Father in heaven. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Begin to tell him how wonderful he is. Hallelujah. Begin to thank him and praise him. Come on, people. Let's lift our voices and pray. Hallelujah. 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 To you, Lord God, be the glory. To you, Lord God, be the honor. To you, Lord God, be all the praise. Hallelujah. We give you thanks this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever time of date is for you, wherever you are. Just give him thanks. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. We thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you, God, that we have been able to rejoice and to be glad in it. Hallelujah. We join with the psalmist David and we declare that from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, yes, Father, your name is worthy you are worthy to be praised for your name is a strong tower we can run into you and find safety hallelujah glory be to God you have done us well hallelujah you have done us well you are good and your mercies endure forever we just bless you today Lord we just bless you today Lord we are glad we are grateful we are appreciative for oh God another opportunity to be found in your house hallelujah another opportunity where we can look into the law of liberty hallelujah another opportunity hallelujah where we can receive teaching we can receive correction we can receive reproof we can receive instruction we can receive rehabilitation through your word we thank you for another opportunity lord god where we can study we can be diligent students diligent workers to show ourselves approved not unto men but unto you lord god work men who do not need to be ashamed but are able to rightly divide the word of truth we humble ourselves before you father we humble ourselves hallelujah before the great teacher the holy spirit spirit and we say spirit of the living God teach us on tonight spirit of the living God break the bread of heaven for us on tonight ah glory be to God shine your light upon the word and cause us to receive edification cause us to receive equipping cause us to receive perfecting on tonight in the name of Jesus point out where we are going wrong point out where there is error point out where we are at fault hallelujah and straighten us oh God again oh God another time we thank you for the school of the Holy Spirit hallelujah where we can learn to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ where we can learn how to be conformed to the will of God where our minds can be renewed and transformed so that we can prove what is the good the acceptable and perfect will of God we thank you for such an opportunity we pray God that the spirit of counsel will rest heavily in this sanctuary and upon this broadcast the spirit of revelation the spirit of knowledge understanding and spiritual wisdom in the name of Jesus cause the eyes of our understanding to be opened in the name of Jesus may we understand the scriptures on tonight oh glory be to God that we can believe and be delivered we can believe and be saved so that oh God your word can take root in our heart and bring forth a harvest bring forth a crop in the name of Jesus right now oh God I rise in the spirit and I come up against everything that would be against hallelujah the teaching of this word on tonight we come up against the birds that are hovering in the spiritual atmosphere waiting for those who would not have attentive hearts waiting for those who would lack understanding to devour and snatch the word away we pray that such oh God an occurrence will not happen on tonight but that there will be great understanding there'll be great focus there'll be great attention oh God to your word on tonight that we might all leave here equipped we might all leave here thoroughly furnished unto every good work in the mighty name of Jesus I give myself to you one more time I hide myself under the blood hallelujah I give myself as an instrument 
instrument, as an oracle, O oh God of yours, that you would speak through me and teach through me in the mighty name of Jesus. We say amen, amen, and amen. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Tonight we're going to jump right into our teaching. Amen. For those of you who saw, amen, the post that talked about what, amen, our Bible study was going to be focusing on tonight. It's going to be focusing on the word upgrade. It's focusing on the word upgrade. And I want you to just think about the word upgrade. And when you hear the word upgrade, what comes to mind? What are some things that come to mind when you hear the word upgrade? Better, okay. Improve, okay. Elevation, new, all right. And I heard somebody saying more. And I'm better, someone said that earlier. And, you know, in life we are familiar with the concept of upgrade. Those of us who are... Um, frequent flyers we, we, we frequent the aircraft moving from place to place we understand what it is to have upgraded tickets yes you might have had an economy ticket in economy class and you you get that upgraded to business class or you might have had a business class ticket and you can have that upgraded to first class and whenever we think of your being upgraded in in terms of flying we understand that the the more you climb in classes is the more space you have yes the seats aren't as close the seats aren't as narrow so so you now have what more room amen to spread out and then the benefits the perks um also increase as we upgrade um from time to time our phones let us know we need to upgrade something. We need to upgrade them because they no longer can store the amount of um, things that we want to store. They no longer can do some things that we are needing them to do. And so whenever they start to behave in a certain way, we know that we need a what? An upgrade. And we can go on and on and talk about upgrading vehicles. Um, um, I had a 2017 Pathfinder. I'm sure now they have a 2021 Pathfinder. It's been upgraded, right? So there are going to be new features, better features, improvement like we're talking about. And it's amazing how in the world, many, many people are always after upgrades. You hear that, you know what, you can upgrade your phone um, just for like $20. If you come in, we have a promotion and, you, and everybody flocks to the, the, the phone store. Uh, because everybody's always looking for an upgrade. We want an upgrade in our appliances. We want an upgrade in our hairstyles. We want an upgrade in our vehicles. We want an upgrade in so many different things, in our computers. But how many people run after an upgrade in spiritual things with that same passion? Huh? How many people look to say, all right, y'all help me out. Y'all know I'm not very tech savvy. So what's the new iPhone, the latest iPhone that they had out, that they have out? iPhone 12, that's what it is. Is there another one on the horizon yet? Or that's the most recent one? The most recent one. All right. So let's, let's go back a few months. Yes. So when it was, we were at iPhone 11, and then you heard about the iPhone 12 coming out, you know that there was a rush. There was this, this, this excitement and this en enthusiasm. People are always looking for the next. We're always looking to hear when is the next upgrade happening. When is this device going to have another upgrade? And we're always, our ears are always peeled and on the lookout for when is the next upgrade. Mm -hmm. However, the question I want to ask tonight before we get into our studies is, do you have that same passion? Do you have that same drive? Are you looking for the next upgrade spiritually all the time? Or that it's only something that's relegated to our physical lives, our natural lives. And tonight, my aim or my, my, my task is to challenge us to want to have an upgrade in our spiritual lives, to challenge us to upgrade who we are, huh? to upgrade to, co to become a better version of who we are, a more improved version of who we are. That is my task on tonight, to challenge us to want to be better, better, better. How often does Apple, it's Apple is the, the, the manufacturer's iPhone, right? How often do, they, uh, do we get a new iPhone? Hello, people who have iPhones. Almost every year we have a new one about that. Mm -hmm. The question is, have you been upgraded every year in the spirit? Or are you still where you, are, you, or where you were three years ago? You're still that same person. Huh? Have you been upgrading? Have you been upgraded? All right? And so tonight we want to talk about upgrade. So without any further ado, we're going to jump right into our teaching for tonight. Um, our teaching for tonight is going to be 
surrounding three main objectives. So by the end of the lesson, you would know that you have been paying attention, you have grasped, you have understood if you're able to answer these three questions. And the first question is, what is the connection between the word and the manifestation of things in our lives? What is the connection between the word and manifestation of things in our lives? Because the manifestation in our lives is what is equivalent to the upgrade. As we are upgraded in the spirit, manifestation should happen. We should be seeing different things happening huh, in our lives. So what is the connection between the word and manifestation of things in our lives? That's the first question or the first section of the Bible study is going to be focused on that. Our second section is going to be focused on what is the relationship between faith, the word, and prayer that brings about manifestation? What is the relationship between faith, the word, and prayer that will bring about the manifestation that we're looking for? What's the manifestation that we're looking for tonight? An upgrade. Mm -hmm. We're looking for an upgrade. But what is the relationship between faith, word, and the prayer that's going to bring that upgrade in our lives? And lastly, what are four processes involving the word that are needed for me to have an upgrade? What are four processes involving the word that are needed for me to have an upgrade? Now, if you are astute or if you're following, you would realize what is pivotal. What is the central thing uh, that my upgrade is surrounding? Give me one word that tells me it's the center of my upgrade. It's going to be the, the, the reason for my upgrade. I, I, it's in every one of the questions, it's in there. Word. word. So the first one is what's the connection between the word and the manifestation of things in our lives? The second one, what is the relationship between faith, the word, and prayer that brings about a manifestation in our lives. And lastly, what are four processes involving the word that are needed for me to have an upgrade? And like you rightly said, the word is at the center of anyone receiving an upgrade. The word is at the center. If there is no word, there is no upgrade. If you're not living in the word, if you're not living by the word, if the word does not become valuable to you, and we saw that last week when we talked about the parable of the sower, it is what is done with the seed of the word that is planted in the heart that determines the crop, that determines the harvest, that determines the upgrade. All right, we are done with this slide for a bit. Let's turn to John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. We're starting our first question. What is the connection between the word and manifestation of things in our lives? What is the connection between the word and my upgrade? Me seeing an upgrade happening. Not just hearing about the upgrade, but seeing the upgrade actually being manifested in my life. Let us read. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, that's the word, and without him, the word, was not anything made that was made. Verse 3 is our key verse. With all things were made by him. By him whom? The word. And without him, the word, was not anything made that was made. If we can have that verse just up for a bit. So those who are maybe traveling in their vehicles and maybe can't turn to a Bible can look at it. So we are told that in the beginning was what? The word. The word was what? With God. And the word was God. What else are we told in verse 3? We are told that nothing came into being, nothing came into existence without the word. Everything that we see or everything that exists, exists because of the word. So 
what are we understanding? Nothing is manifested in the earth realm without it first being spoken. What did I just say? Nothing is manifested in the earth realm without it first being spoken. And tonight our focus is going to be on the Logos word, the written word. Next week, we're going to finish. We're going to have a part two, and that's going to be on the rhema words. We're going to talk about words of prophecies and prophetic words and how, amen, we can get an upgrade, how we can see the manifestation of what has been spoken over our lives through those rhema words. But nothing is manifested in the earth realm without it first being spoken. Whenever God wants something to be done in the earth, that is something manifested, he speaks a word. Whenever God wants something to be done in the earth, what does he do? He speaks a word. At the beginning of the Old Testament, we saw this principle in action. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. And the earth was without form, and it was void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God is moving. Did anything manifest? Did anything come into being? Did anything materialize while the Spirit of God is moving on the water? At what point did we begin to see things manifesting? Things becoming visible, tangible, where we can actually realize it with our senses? When God spoke. So we see the principle in the beginning. The principle is the spirit of God is needed. But the spirit of God waits for what? The word of God. And then when the spirit of God receives that word. Then together it acts. And there's a creative force that brings something into being. Nothing manifests, manifests in the earth realm without a word. So if I upgrade if i want a better version of me to happen if i want to see improvement in my spiritual life if i want to see growth in my spiritual life if i want advancement in god in the things of god what do i need first i need a word without a word i will not achieve advancement i will not achieve improvement i will not achieve betterment all right so that was the beginning of the old testament let's jump over to the beginning of the new testament in the beginning of the new testament in luke chapter 1 verses 13 and verse 20 we see that god is about to do something the fullness of time has come and it's time for the messiah to be born but we know that before the messiah was to be born there was going to be a forerunner who was going to come before him yes malachi did prophesy the voice of one that was going to go before him prepare ye the way of the lord isaiah and the others prophesied and we see that the prophet of the highest who is going to be the forerunner he needs to come forth he needs to be manifested he needs to become flesh he needs to be visible there was a prophetic word that talked about him before same thing with the messiah there was a prophetic word that was uttered before but in order for it to manifest in the vessels through which they were going to come those vessels had to receive a word i'm going to say that again john was prophesied about jesus was prophesied about by the prophets of old but in order for that manifestation to happen through the vessels that God had picked for them to come through, those vessels needed to receive a word. So we are told in Luke chapter 1 and verse 13 that Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, goes into the temple where Zechariah the priest was ministering. And he said unto him, fear not, Zechariah, Luke 1, 13, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. So what is the word that the, that the angel is saying? He's saying, listen here, your wife who was barren, that the two of you have been praying about having children, God has heard your prayer, and I am now bringing the word to you so that manifestation of what you're praying about can happen. What's the word that I'm bringing to you? You shall receive a son. Your wife shall bear a son. That's the word. Let's jump down to verse 20. We know that Zechariah didn't believe. How do I know that? Because of what verse 20 says. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak 
until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. What point am I making? The point I'm making is, if something is going to manifest in my life, hmm, I need to receive a word. Somebody else can't receive the word for me. Somebody else can know of the word, they can speak the word, but who has to receive the word? The person who wants the manifestation must be a recipient of that word. Because nothing is going to manifest in my life. That's the principle that God has set down. Nothing manifests without a word. All right, let's move on. Luke one thirty-five, same chapter we're going down. Gabriel leaves um, Zechariah and he goes and he visits Mary. He says to Mary, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And Mary said, behold, that's verse 38, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. That phrase or statement that she made is the principle. It is done to me according to the word that I receive. I'm going to say that again. It is done to me according to the word that I receive. I want you to say that to yourself. Touch your heart where the heart, where the word goes and say that to yourself. It is done to me according to the word that I receive. Not according to the word that was preached. I'm going to say that again. Not according to the word that was preached. Not according to the word that was taught. It is done to me according to the word that I receive. See, Mary was receiving the totality of the word. Mm -hmm. She grabbed the whole of that word and she said, let it be unto me according to your word. So, the first question that we were looking at, asking for our objectives was, what is the connection between the word and manifestation of things in our lives? What is the connection between the word and the manifestation of things in my life? In order for things to manifest in my life, the principle that God has put down is that I must receive a word concerning that thing. So if I want finances to be manifested in my life, I need a word about finances. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm struggling with a temper, with anger, and I want that thing to come out of my life, and I want to manifest in its, in its place, calmness, huh? um, I need a word concerning that anger. I need the word. I need to receive that word. And then when, remember last week we talked about it. When I receive that word, then the word begins to work in me. And over time, what's going to come out of my life? The crop of the word. Because the word is a seed. Huh? So a harvest, plentiful, abundant results from that seed is going to eventually come out. But I first must receive a word. So to answer our question. What is, and that you can, that's a good slide to show, what is the relationship or the connection between the word and manifestation of things in our lives? The relationship is nothing will manifest in my life hmm, unless first I have a word. Mm -hmm. Whenever God wants something to be manifested in my life, he is going to give me a word. That's what prophecy is about. Prophecy isn't about us feeling happy. Prophecy isn't about making you feel good. Or even making you feel bad. Prophecy comes so that manifestation can come. Because without a word, there can be no manifestation. And, and, and this is a problem a lot of us are having in, in Christendom, in, in, in the church world, in the body of Christ. We keep saying that the word doesn't work. We keep saying, th we don't say it with our mouth, but our lives say that. Mm -hmm. we, we keep saying, I don't understand why I've been praying, 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 and I'm not seeing any results. Prayer does not bring forth the manifestation by itself. Prayer works with something else. And we're going to talk about that. So our next question is, which is our second question, so we're moving along. Our third is going to be the most meaty. But the second question is, what is the relationship between faith, the word, and prayer 
that brings about manifestation. So the first principle we understood is nothing is going to be manifested in my life in the earth realm without a word. My praying about a word is not going to make manifestation happen. The first step is I have to receive the word. Mm -hmm. I have to receive the word. Let's, let's, let's look back at last week's lesson. Last week's lesson, we were talking about, oh Lord, my heart, remember? And we were looking at the parable of the sower as our main text. And we learned through that parable the process that the word goes through once it is preached and received by an individual. Remember, we talked about that. We said, first of all, in order for anything to happen in our life, we must first hear a word. We talked about that, right? The Bible says, we what? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word. All right. So we must first hear a word. But then we also understood that it's not enough for us to hear the word. We must also what? Understand the word that we hear. Mm -hmm. remember we read in Matthew chapter 13 that if anyone hears the word Matthew 13 and verse 19 Jesus said this if you hear the word of the kingdom and you do not understand it then comes the wicked one and catches it away from you he devours it so I must hear the word I must understand the word but then after I understand it what must I do with it I must believe it because how many of us know that we can understand something and not believe it mm-hmm when I went to college and, and they taught me, we, we, I had to do humanities and they taught me about all sorts of different religions. I understood what they were saying. I understood it enough that I could write a paper, I could write an essay, I can get an A and an A plus on it. But ask me, did I believe those things that I wrote? No. So it's one thing to understand what the preacher is saying. It's another thing, to, not one thing to understand what the teacher is teaching. But it's another thing to believe what you understand. Huh? Luke chapter 8, last week we learned that those by the wayside was those who heard the word and then the devil comes and takes away the word from them quickly lest they should believe. Why does he want them to believe? Because when I believe it, what does he tell me happens? I receive what? Salvation. I receive deliverance. I receive rescue. I receive recovery. I receive a power that can put me on the path to manifestation. I'm going to say that again. The devil comes whenever I hear a word and I understand it. He tries to, whenever I hear a word and don't understand it, he tries to snatch it away from me so that I won't understand and I won't believe. Because Luke, in Luke, Jesus says, if they believe, then they're going to be saved. And I told us last week, salvation is not always about sin. Huh? It's healing, restoration, recovery, mm -hmm, deliverance. So the enemy's task is to make sure that you are not on the path to manifestation. How do I get on the path to manifestation? By hearing, understanding, and believing. Once I have met those three conditions, I am on the path for manifestation to begin to work in my life. And if I stand the test of time, given time, you're going to see that thing that the word had spoken over me. All right. But then we also understood that after I believe, that belief must now be converted into a deep conviction. It cannot just be a mental belief. It cannot just be a surface belief. It must be what? A deep conviction conviction remember the the stony ground people the stony ground hearts they were the ones who did believe but they didn't have any root in themselves they had no deep conviction so what happened after a while when persecution came because of the word when tribulations and afflictions came because of the word they were offended and they fell away hmm? so it's when I hear the word, when I understand it and I believe it, I'm on the path to manifestation. But based on the parable of the sower, I can be on the path to manifestation and still not receive manifestation. Are you seeing that? If I just stay at a surface belief and I do not allow a deep conviction, a persuasion about what I believe to take root in my heart, I can be on the path to manifestation and still lose out. All right, so I must do what? Hear, understand, believe. That belief must be converted to a deep conviction. And the last thing that we, um, the last, second to last thing we saw from the parable of the soul is I have to give the word room to grow in me. 
Remember, we talked about the thorny soil. I have to make sure there's nothing in me, nothing in my heart, nothing in my mind, nothing in my life that is competing with the word. Hmm? Because if there are things that are competing with the word, even though I'm on the path to manifestation, again, I will not experience the manifestation of the very thing that I'm hoping for. And, and this is the answer to many believers who are saying, Pastor Alex, you don't understand. I've been praying, praying for 10 years about that thing and nothing has happened. What have, first of all, have you gotten a word about that thing? <laughs> Do you know how you're supposed to be praying about that thing? And secondly, what have you been doing with the word? Do you understand the word? Do you believe it? Do you have a deep conviction concerning it? Are there things in your life that's competing with the word? Huh? If there are things competing, you will never see the manifestation in our life. And tonight we're talking about how can I get an upgrade? How can I improve spiritually? How can I become a better version of who I am? How can I advance? How can I elevate? How can I be promoted in God, in the things of God, in my spiritual life? And we're talking about this process. It is hooked on the word of God. All right. And lastly, we learned last week that not only must there be room, but there must be time. I must what? Be patient. I must endure until the manifestation happens. All right. So, we're still answering the question, what is the relationship between, the, between faith, the word, and prayer that brings about the manifestation? Because I'm answering the question, Pastor Alex, I've been, I am one of those people who want an upgrade in the Lord. I desire to be spiritually better. I desire to grow in God. I desire to develop in the things of God. But no matter what I do, it's not happening. I've been praying a lot. I even fasted on it, and nothing is happening. This might be your answer on tonight. All right. So we see that the word of God has the power to bring salvation. Romans 1.16. We understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. But even though the word of God has power to bring salvation, I must believe the word of God that comes. And then we understood that it's our understanding and belief of the word that's going to prevent Satan from stealing that word from our hearts. Let's look at Luke chapter 18. We're not going to read the whole parable. Those of you who have time can read it on your own. But Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, Jesus is giving the, the parable. He's speaking a parable, um, using the parable to illustrate the fact that we should always pray and not stop praying. Okay? So we're talking about what's the, the connection, the relationship between faith, the word, and prayer. So in this particular parable, he starts out by saying in verse 1, men ought always to pray and not to faint, not to cease, not to give up, not to lose heart. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. And he gives a story about a lady, a widow woman, who went to this judge and to seek um, justice, and the judge would not pay her any mind. But she kept on going and going and going and going. And then the judge says in verse 5, he says, And for though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this would have trouble at me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she wearies me. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus is telling the parable, and he ends the parable with the question, When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? That's what he ends the parable with. Okay? Let's jump over to Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8, verses 11 to 12. Amos is in the Old Testament. You can go to Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and then Amos would be next. Okay? Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. We're talking about what is the relationship between faith the word and prayer that would bring about a manifestation. So Jesus is talking about praying, right? He ends his parable about praying with, well, he's teaching us not to give up praying. Don't stop praying. Don't lose heart. Don't faint. Don't turn coward. Keep on praying even when it looks like nothing is happening. Then he ends it by asking, when I come back, when the Son of Man returns, am I going to find this level of faith like this woman had in the earth? Am I going to find faith in the earth? Amos chapter 8, verses 11 to 12. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of what? 
but of hearing the words of the Lord. What does that last clause sound like? What scripture have I been quoting for these past two weeks? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, right? Jesus is, God is saying, the Lord God is saying through the mouth of Amos, that there's going to come a time when he's going to send a famine. The famine that he's going to send has nothing to do with bread and water. It's not literal food. But the famine that he's going to send is a famine, not a famine of the word of the Lord. That's what I, I have quoted it wrong in the past. Two people say it's a famine of the word of the Lord. That's not what it is. It's a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Verse 11, Amos 8 and verse 11. Jesus many times would say when he was teaching, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Which means that the word of God can be preached, but you not hear it. Because the hearing here is not, we're not talking about the sensory organ, the sensory perception of it bouncing off of my ear and I'm hearing. We're talking, this hearing we're talking about goes deeper than just hearing sounds. It's actually attending to being able to understand it so you can receive it and believe it. He says there's going to come a time when it, there's going to be a famine, there's going to be a lack. There is going to be an insufficiency in men's ability to do what? Hear the word of the Lord. So, if I can't hear the word of the Lord, what can I not have? You, you've gone too far. I can't have faith. Because faith comes by hearing. So if I am at, if I'm of the people who lack the ability to hear the word of the Lord, and trust me, right now there are people sitting down in congregations. There are people who are going to listen to me tonight. They're going to sit and listen to the whole teaching and have not heard the word of the Lord. They heard Alex talking words that came out of her mouth. The words that came out of her mouth made sense. And it might have even tickled them, but they did not hear the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. He says a time is going to come. That's why he's asking, is there going to be faith when I come back? Because without a hearing of the word, there cannot be faith. Again, without a hearing of the word of the Lord, there cannot be faith. Without a hear, that's why it's important when you go to church, when you sit down on the man or woman of God, when you go to Bible study, when you go to prayer meeting, even the praise and worship, when they're singing, you should be hearing the word of the Lord. You should not only be hearing the music and the rhythm and the voices and the melody. Out of all of that singing, you should be hearing the word of the Lord. Because if I fail to hear, if I become deaf to the voice of God, if I become deaf, to the voice of the word of the Lord, I will never receive manifestation because I will not have faith. And we're going to see what, what faith's role is. All right, let's go back to Amos. We're not done yet. Amos chapter 8 and verse 11. He says, the time is going to come when there's going to be a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Verse 12. And they shall wander. It's not up there, sorry. They shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. You know why they can't find it? Because they can't hear it. Mm. They cannot what? hear it folks we have to be careful about how we respond to the word of god if there is a famine of hearing the words of the lord then there will also be a famine of faith do you agree because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of god so if there's no hearing of the word of god there can be no faith faith cannot exist in the absence of the word we're all going to say that Faith cannot exist in the absence of the word. So there, there, there are some people who say, I'm not a word person, I'm a prayer person. You are praying in vain. Any person who's a prayer person and not a word person, your prayers are in vain. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is what is going to bring the manifestation, but faith does not exist where the word of God is absent. Do you hear what I'm saying? So, so all these people who don't like the word, I just love to pray, I love to fast, I love to, you know, I'm really deep in God, you know. You know, the Lord will speak to me, however, however, however. 
Mm -mm. Faith cannot exist in the absence of the word. Why? We need to, by the time I'm finished with you all, y'all should be able to hear Romans 10, 17 in your sleep. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So praying with the word produces nothing. Praying without the word produces nothing. Praying without belief in the word produces nothing. I said two things. I said two things. What did I say? I said praying without the word produces nothing. And praying without belief in the word will produce nothing. Because faith cannot exist in the absence of the word. Mm -hmm. Faith cannot exist in the absence of the word. So, I must hear the word and I must believe the word. Mm -hmm. So, the hearing of the word plus faith, plus prayer, is what is going to produce manifestation. I'm going to say that again. The hearing of the word, plus faith, plus prayer, is what's going to produce manifestation. One more time. The hearing of the word, plus faith, so I must hear it, believe it, but remember the belief we're talking about is what? Not the surface belief, but a deep conviction. Mm -hmm. Plus prayer is what is going to produce manifestation in my life. Let's, let's look at 1 Kings and, and, and verse 18. 1 Kings 18. We all who are Bible people, we, we are familiar with this. Those who are not, you can read 1 Kings 17. That's where the actual context begins. 1 Kings chapter 17. But we're only going to go to 1 Kings 18 for now. 1 Kings chapter 18, we are told the story of Elijah, remember? All right, Elijah says in verse 41, and, and we're going to talk more about this sound when we talk about the rhema word on next week. Mm -hmm. Because the word has a voice. The word has a voice, and we're going to talk about that on next week. And voices make what? You hear a voice, you think of sound. All right. 1 Kings 18 and verse 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Now, Elijah is a prophet. Mm -hmm. And so Elijah is, is, he is in tune with the spiritual realm. And so even though the natural, in the natural, there was no rain clouds, they were experiencing a drought for some years now. Mm -hmm. There was no evidence that there was any moisture in the atmosphere that rain would come, much less abundance of rain. Elijah tapping into the spiritual atmosphere, he heard a sound. And the sound that he heard translated into his speech that he gave us the words, there is a sound of abundance of rain. Rain is coming. Plenty rain is coming. That was the word that he got. Mm -hmm. That's the word he got. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. He said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again. They did this, what, seven times. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. Did the rain start yet? All that he saw, what, what, what was manifested? A little cloud. Mm -hmm. But Elijah knew that in the realm of God, in the kingdom of God, God's principle is once a word is released, what follows? manifestation if the word is received believed and prayed through nothing can stop the manifestation that's why elijah kept saying to the servant go back because i am meeting all of the conditions i have heard the word i've believed the word that i heard and i'm praying it through so I'm keep I I'm gonna keep doing my part. Your job is to look for the manifestation. My job is to pray this thing through. 
And so he kept on praying and praying. He didn't stop praying because he believed, he understood that once a word is released, if it is received, if it is believed, and if it's prayed through, manifestation must follow. All he wanted was some kind of manifestation. Notice, when the servant said, I only see a little cloud, he did not say, all right, I need to keep praying because it's God not manifesting. God is not manifesting. God, I don't. He got manifestation. He understood that his job now was to just walk in it. Walk in that thing and the, the fullness would come as I begin to walk in the little that was manifested. Are you following me there? So when, when the servant came back and said about the little cloud, he stopped praying. And, and that's what's, what, what, what that, that, that word is an answer for somebody. You have already seen manifestation, but you don't believe it. It's too little for you to accept that it's manifestation. And so doubt has crept in and God is saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? I've already answered. This is no time for you to get up and move with the little manifestation that you got. He didn't say, notice when we started out, we didn't say great things are manifested. Huh? We just simply said what? Anything that's going to be manifested in the earth realm needs a word. So once I see manifestation, my next move is to walk in it. Mm -hmm. When Pastor Thad was doing his cucumber um, farming when we were in Antigua, he didn't wait for the whole field to fill off with cucumber, mature cucumbers before he started harvesting. Did you wait for the whole field? Hmm? When, the, when the crop started coming, it comes in a little at a time, right? It comes in a little and you start to reap. You start to reap and then eventually the fullness comes. And, and, and as Christians, we are so set on, you know, if it's not big, if it's not huge, if it's not coming with thunder and lightning and boom boom explosion, it's not God. God is not answering. God has answered many of our prayers with a little cloud. But because our conviction is not deep, we can't accept the little cloud as manifestation. Because our conviction, it was his name, Elijah had a deep conviction. He understood that once a little cloud is visible, what will follow will be what I heard. What, what did he hear? Abundance of rain. And if we continued reading, did abundance come? Mm -hmm. It came to pass in verse 45. In the meanwhile, that the heavens was black with clouds and wind. <laughs> in the meanwhile, over time, the little cloud changed into what? The black looking sky. Mm -hmm. that, shows, uh, that shows that what? Abundance of rain is about to fall. And there was a great rain. And I'm not going to read further because that's where we're at. So let's answer our question. What was the question that we asked? Our number two question was what? What is the relationship between faith, the word, and prayer that brings about manifestation? The relationship is that the spirit waits on the word. Remember, we saw that in Genesis 1-2. The spirit waits on the word. It's the belief in the word that gives one the perseverance needed to keep on praying. I'm going to say that. It's my belief, my faith in the word. That's why your, your conviction has to be deep. This is why your conviction has to be deep. Because sometimes, like the widow, it's a long time before you see manifestation, yes? Mm -hmm. This is why when you get your word that word, you have to really receive that word and let it move from a mental belief to a deep conviction because you don't know how long it's going to take for manifestation. But the faith says that once I have a word, I'm guaranteed manifestation. That's what faith says. Faith says all I need is a word. Once I know I have a word, because the word is a seed. Remember we read that last week. The word is a seed. So if I have seed, I have crop. Mm -hmm. And if I do everything that I need to do in between to secure the crop, then I'm going to have crop. So faith says once I have a word, my job is to hang in there in prayer. Hang in there with prayer. Like Daniel, remember Daniel, he prayed. He was waiting for the manifestation, which is the answer to come back. What did he keep on doing? He kept on praying. What did the angel say to him? He said from the moment you set your heart to pray, God already sent the answer. The manifestation was already coming down. But I was intercepted. He said, but guess what? You kept on praying for 21 days. You kept on praying. You kept on praying. When did he stop praying? He stopped praying when the angel showed up with the answer. 
Hmm? And for those of us who are believing the Lord for not only upgrading our lives, but we're believing the Lord for some external things in our lives to happen. We're believing the Lord for salvation of loved ones. We're believing the Lord for some things to happen in our jobs. We're believing for the Lord for some things to happen in our marriages, in our children, in our ministry. We're believing the Lord for some things to happen in our city, our community, our nation. The, tonight, the manifestation will only come if you have a deep conviction, if you've gotten a word, if you have a deep conviction for it, and if you have the perseverance, you have the tenacity like that widow in Luke chapter 18, like Daniel in Daniel chapter 10, like Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18. That's three witnesses telling us that once you have a word and you stick with it by faith, manifestation will come. It will come. It might take time, but it will come. Amen? So, I must have a word to believe. What is the, I'm, I'm going to give you the final answer now for our question on what is the connection between, the, between faith, the word, and prayer for manifestation. I must have a word to believe. That's where it starts. So if I want something to manifest in my life, I must have a word to believe. Mm -hmm. Some of us are praying for, some of you are praying for husbands and for wives. You need a word from the Lord. You need a word from the Lord. That's where it begins. Hmm? You need a word from the Lord. Get, seek God for a word. You need a word from the Lord. That's where it begins. When you get the word, you need to believe the word and spend time on that word until it becomes a deep conviction. Why does it have to be a deep conviction? Because time has a way, Pastor Thad prayed on Sunday morning, talked about the fact that sometimes when hope gets deferred, it makes us sick. It makes us mentally sick, emotionally sick, sometimes physically sick. So if you got a word, yeah, but you don't have a deep conviction, a deep belief about that word, and time starts to tarry and tarry, after a while, you're going to get sick waiting on that thing. After a while, you're going to give up. After a while, you're going to start to manufacture manifestations for yourself. Mm, and then call it God's manifestation. Mm? But then if you have a deep conviction, even when there are days that you might feel down and you might feel despondent, your faith will not fail. You're going to rise again and start, okay, let's go again. I believe this thing. I believe this thing. God, I'm waiting on you. God, I believe you. You said this. And your prayer will continue to fashion that. So I must have a word to believe in. The belief in that word is what's going to fuel my perseverance in prayer. So I do not cease praying until manifestation is seen. So what's the connection between faith, the word, prayer, and manifestation? I must first have a word to believe. When I get that word, I must make sure that that belief becomes a deep conviction, becomes that driving faith, because that is what is going to fuel my perseverance in prayer until the manifestation comes. All right? Good job, guys. Now we're going to go into our third and final question, which is our biggest one for the night. Are we making good time? Yes, we are. We're making good time. So as we continue to expect great things in this new year, one of the expectations for many is to be better children of God. Pastor Tad, you can just let the previous slide stay up on the, in case some people are trying to process the answer to that question. Many people, and I believe that many of us, I believe that all of God's children want to be better. All of us who, who are God's children, we want to improve. We want to grow in God. We want to develop in God. We want to do more for God, don't we? Mm -hmm. We want to be better in our study life and our application of the word. We want to be better in our prayer life and our personal time and personal relationship with the Lord. Amen? Is that so? Well, at least I do. We want to be better in a relationship with others. We want to be better in the various assignments that God has given us as students, as, as career people, as um, spouses, as parents, as children, huh? as ministry workers. We want to be better. I believe that every single one of us want to be better. Better is what we want to see manifested in our lives. So tonight, when I'm talking about the manifestation, every time you hear me say manifestation, we talk about being better, being upgraded, getting an upgrade. Mm -hmm. We understand that becoming better will involve adding and removing some things or replacing some things. 
in order for me to be better. There are some things I need to add to my life. There are some things I need to remove from my life. There are some things I need to replace if I'm going to be better. Yes? So as to improve, advance, and rise in quality and standard. This better can therefore be translated to a word for tonight called upgrade. Upgrading to a better version of myself. And the Bible teaches this principle. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. It is not wrong to want to be upgraded. In fact, that's what should be happening in our lives as children of God. We should be upgrading more and more until we become closer and closer to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Spirit of the Lord is the one who is changing us. I'm going to talk about that. From glory to glory. The Amplified says, we continue to behold in the word of God as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and are constantly being transfigured into his very own image in ever increasing splendor from one degree of glory to another and this comes from the Lord who is our spirit. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says be not conformed to this world but be what? Transformed by the renewing of our mind. And those of you who've heard me teach that over and over again, I say that that word transform comes from the Greek word from which we get our English word metamorphosis. And every time you think about that, so every time you read Romans 12 too, think about the caterpillar hmm, changing into, transforming into a chrysalis and then transforming into a beautiful butterfly. Every time you hear Romans 12 too, transform. And that's what the caterpillar transformed. He got upgraded, didn't they get upgraded? That was a major upgrade. No longer was he the hungry little cap caterpillar that moves slowly, slowly. All he does is eat and he stays on a leaf. If you shake the leaf, he's at the mercies of everybody else. Huh? Well, yes. But he transforms into what now? A heaven-bound, flying, beautiful creature. That's what God wants us to do. Upgrade. So we can move from these slow, sluggish, sleepy, earthbound creatures to flying creatures that can reproduce after what kind. All right? So it is God's will for us to do what? To be upgraded. What is our fourth or third question? Pastor Tad, you can take that off if you're ready. What are four processes involving the word that are needed for me to have an upgrade? Okay. So let's, re let's, let's backtrack a bit. So we've learned so far that if I'm going to see any kind of manifestation, I need the word, right? It begins with the word. Mm -hmm. It also needs what? Faith. And it also needs prayer, right? So we are now going to talk about four processes that the word works in us to bring out or to offer us an upgrade. Mm -hmm. Four things that the word works in us, four processes, four functions. And to do that, we're going to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, verses 16 and 17. This is our last section of the Bible study that we are going to. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For now, our main focus is going to be verse 16. And then when we are coming to a conclusion, we're going to bring in verse 17. But verse 16 is our main focus. Are we ready? I'm reading from the King James Version. I should have said that earlier. All of my scriptures are from, are from the King James Version unless I indicate otherwise. All right. We are reading verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. But we are focusing on verse 16. What are the four processes mentioned in verse 16 that the word does? Doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. All right, so let's go through these. We've just learned that anything that will manifest on in the earth realm must begin with the word. However, the understanding or revelation of that word is key to its manifestation. What did I say? The understanding or revelation of the word is key. 
So if Elijah had heard a sound and was not able to interpret the sound correctly, if he did not understand what the sound was communicating, then he would not know how to pray and what to pray. And so the manifestation would not have occurred. You follow where I'm going with this? All right? So it is key for us to have a revelation or understanding of what it is that we are hearing. Okay? So that our belief is not faulty. One of the reasons that we lack, one of the reasons, one, that we lack manifestation of things in our life is because our understanding of the word is faulty. It's what? Faulty. It's faulty. I remember when I was growing up, I grew up in a very um, fundamental um, type of um, church setting. Very, 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 very strict. Very strict. Very strict. Um, thank God for the day that my parents got liberated. Hallelujah. Very strict. And the, the, there are some people who were of that faith and are still in that faith that have a faulty understanding of certain scriptures. And as such, certain manifestations cannot happen in their lives, will never happen. Because the understanding of the scripture is faulty. So the word can't work to produce what it should produce because they don't understand it right. Are you following what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's like my husband, he bought me a tablet for, um, for my birthday. Was it my birthday or Valentine's? Last year sometime. I think it was Valentine's. Yes, he bought me a tablet for, my, for Valentine's last year. I love my tablet. But I don't understand how to work Alexa. <laughs> she and I, you know, we, we have issues. And so even though there's that feature that can, you know, make life a less, a, a, um, less harassing, you know, it, it can bring a benefit for me, I cannot access that feature because my understanding of it is faulty. So the, 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 the tablet isn't faulty, what the manufacturer's intended to happen is not faulty. It's my understanding of it is faulty. And so therefore, I cannot, I, I, I use my tablet and I get other uses out of it and other benefits out of it. But that particular benefit I will never experience until I can understand it. You follow what I'm saying? And it's the same thing in the word of God. If we do not understand the processes, how the word works, if it's faulty, no matter how much we are sincere, sincerity has nothing to do with it. I sincerely love my tablet. But my sincerity in loving the tablet is not going to get Alexa to work. I have to have an understanding of it for it to work. And there are many Christians who, and I'm going to borrow this phrase from my aunt, she used to like to use it a lot. There are many Christians who are sincerely wrong. They are sincere in their love for God. They're, in, they're sincere in, in, their, in their passion for the word and their passion for the things of God. But they lack understanding. It's faulty. And as such, no manifestation is happening. And they become frustrated. They become discouraged because it seems like the word is not working. When the problem is not the manufacturer, the problem is not the word, the problem is you. You have a faulty understanding. And so there are certain processes that the word must work in us if we're going to have an upgrade. If we're going to see improvement in our life, good night, Sister Maureen. If we're going to see improvement in our life, if we're going to see advancement, if our quality and standard of our lives are going to rise where we can produce a crop, a manifestation, that's not just a trickle, but it's huge in our lives, we have to make sure that we understand these processes and allow them to work for us all right so what are the processes the four processes are doctrine reproof correction and instruction and i have coined little um ways of us remembering them if pastor that will go on to the next slide i'm not sure if it's the next one i might be mistaken but the first one, doctrine, it's supposed to be informative. So these are four functions that the word does. It's informative. Doctrine is informative. Reproof is diagnostic. And we're going to talk about this in a minute. Reproof is diagnostic. Correction is corrective. And the instruction in righteousness is rehabilitative. These are four processes that the word works in us in order to bring manifestation in our lives. Some Christians only want information. 
but they reject the diagnostic element of the word. Some Christians, I know when we, have, we, were, we, were, we were pastoring in Antigua, I remember the early years of prayer, faith, and encouragement ministry, you know, infancy in Antigua. Apostle was a rough apostle. Amen. She believed in the corrective, she had a rough pastor. She believed in the corrective work of the word. Mm -hmm. The diagnostic and the corrective. And people used to th say that it didn't call for all that. People would go away offended, not realizing that you cannot have an upgrade unless diagnostics happen. And correct, you, you know, all of these people that improve on all of these phones and devices, they did diagnostics. That's right, Pastor Thad said, that's why they collect data. They do, they, 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 they do diagnostics and then there are corrective elements that they do to the devices to make them better. Is, is that not so? Uh-huh. If, if, if those elements are missing, they are going to be selling you a product that they say is upgraded, but it's not upgraded. It's simply what it was before and they just prettied up the outside. And many Christians, that's what they want. They, they, they want information and pretty them up and say that they are advancing in the spirit. They're deep now. They, they, they're, they're spiritually growing. Lies. There is a diagnostic element. There is a corrective element. And there's a rehabilitative element to the word. If these four functions aren't happening in my life, I cannot be upgraded, folks. I cannot be better. I cannot be improved. No better version of me is going to happen unless these four processes take place. Let's dig into them a little bit deeper. Let's start from the beginning of the scripture. You can come out. All scripture, it says, is given by the inspiration of God. That word scripture, those of you who are English people, the, the root word is script, right? Right? And it's talking about what? What does that root word talk of? Written or writing, all right? So it was translated from a Greek word, the Greek word graphe, which speaks about writing and written. So when we're talking about scripture, that's why I said tonight I'm focusing on the, the logos. We're talking about the written words of God, the holy writings, okay? Or Bible, yes? So the Bible, all scripture... Mm -hmm. All of it, the whole Bible, this thing that is written in our Bible, it was given by the inspiration of God. And that phrase, inspiration of God, means that it was God-breathed. It was divinely breathed in by God. God inspired. God breathed into these men who wrote these things and these words, our content that we have here, and he divinely inspired them to write. He said, write about your life. Write about that. Write about that. Mm -hmm. He divinely inspire them to write he breathed he breathed life into the scriptures mm -hmm. god breathed life into the scriptures so this scriptures when i read them mm, they're light jesus says to said in, in in some one of the gospel i think it's john search the scriptures for in them what you think you'll find what eternal life so the scriptures we talk tonight we're talking about this next week we're going to talk about rhema today about the written word so all of this everything in here is given by the inspiration of god that's why those of you anybody who has come up in our ministry and heard me teach you would tell you'd hear me tell you down to the genealogies i don't just skim over them they are in there for a reason there is something in there that's either informative diagnostic corrective or rehabilitative for me in the genealogies uh-huh it was a genealogy that they were writing when we inserted that they inserted a whole thing about Jabez. Three verses and everybody now have it a big Jabez prayer, Jabez song. Jabez, it was a genealogy, we know that. But yet, we were able to do what? Receive from that information, diag um, diagnosis, correction, rehabilitation. All right, let's move on. So, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. That word profitable means useful, valuable, beneficial, advantageous. It is good for. It empowers us too. Okay? So, every scripture has profit in it. Every scripture has profit in it. What's the profit I'm going to receive? If I let that word work for me, I'm going to have a better version of me coming out at the other end. Because the scripture is profitable. It's useful to me. It's beneficial for my life. All right. What is it profitable for? Let's run on. 
The first one is doctrine. So, all the holy writings are God-given and they are made alive by him. I am helped when I am taught the word of God. Mm -hmm. Whenever I receive, hear, or read a word, I should be asking myself, how is this scripture helpful to me? How does this benefit me? What value is there in this scripture? How is this good for me? How does this empower me? Hmm? These are the questions that we should be asking when we read. Hmm? Not just rushing through to memorize and say, I, can, I have read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I have memorized the whole book of Psalms. What profit is that to you? Hmm? There was, 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 what profit did that bring for you? All right, so let's move to the first one. Doctrine. It's informative. That word doctrine, many of the other translations refer to it as teaching or instruction. So the first thing that the Bible or the scriptures do for me is they teach me. They inform me. They provide me with knowledge. They provide me with what? Knowledge. They provide me with useful information. They provide me with explanation of things. Mm-hmm. Another word for that informative is they illuminate or they bring, they shed light on. So when, when, when I pick up the Bible and I begin to read, preach the word, of, preach the word be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Okay, right now this is giving me information. It's, the information it's giving me is a set of commands of things that I should be doing. Well, we know this is for pastor. Right, the context. But let's just say, things that is giving me information, is shedding light on the role of a pastor, what a pastor should be doing. It's teaching me. It's instructing me. This is what a pastor does. A pastor preaches the word. A pastor is in instant in season and out of season. He reproves, he rebukes, he exhorts with all long suffering and doctrine. That's the first thing it should do to me. It should do what? Give me information. The word is a teacher. It instructs us in what is true. It does what? Instructs us in what is true. So when I go to school and school tells me that we evolved from whatever we evolved from, I say, okay, that's a fact that I need to learn to pass my science class. But that is not truth. Where do I get truth from? I get truth from the word of God. Mm -hmm. And this is the first part. The first stage is just getting truth. Just getting information. Just getting information. Just getting information. But guess what? If I don't believe the information that I get, I can't move on to the second process. The second process won't work. So, the first process is he's teaching me. He's giving me information. He's giving me knowledge. He's shedding light. He's opening up my eyes to things that I did not know before. I turn to a scripture and the scripture says, be angry and sin not. Oh, I didn't know that I could be angry but yet not sin. Huh? See, it's giving me what? Information. The first part of it is it's informative. It's like a teacher. That, well, that's what the word is. It's a teacher. It teaches me truth. From God's perspective, what is true? All right. Psalms 119 and verse 130 says, The entrance of your word brings light. So, as I am engaging with the word, as I'm reading the word, as the Holy Spirit is teaching me the word, light is coming. What was the purpose of light? To illuminate, to cause you to see where once you were dark. And whenever, well, most times when you hear about darkness in the Bible, when it's talking about understanding, it's talking about ignorance and lack of understanding and blindness, huh? spiritual blindness. So when Psalms is telling us, David is telling us that once the word enters, it brings light. He's letting me know that when I engage with the word, when I allow the word, I'm not, I'm not studying anything deep. I'm just getting information. It's the surface. I'm just getting information from the word. As I engage with the word and allow it to be informative, 
Allow it to be doctrine. Allow it to be teaching. Allow it to just give me and flood me with information. What's happening when I engage? Light is coming. Which means that where I once did not know, he's causing me to know. Where I once did not understand, he's going to cause the eyes of my understanding to be what? Open. But that's as I, the more I engage with the word. Remember I talked about the fact that the word is active. It's powerful. It's life. Remember we talked about all that last week. So the more I engage with the word and allow the word to give me information, is the more light enters my life and I'm able to see more clearly. The eyes of my understanding open. The Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Hosea 4 and 6 says what? Huh? My people are destroyed because what? They reject knowledge. Mm -hmm. They reject knowledge. And that's the first part of the, we must become knowledgeable of the word. And notice I'm not talking about digging deep and knowing Greek and Hebrew and all of that. I'm not talking about all that. I'm just talking about being familiar with what the word says. What does the word say about sin? What does the word say about my marriage? I'm moving on to things. So if I want manifestation, we're talking about upgrade. I want an upgrade in my marriage. Okay? All right. Let's start going to the word for doctrine. What's doctrine? Teaching. What's teaching? Imparting information and knowledge. Begin to turn the scriptures and just read. What is he saying about marriage? What does God say about marriage? What does God say about marriage? What does the word say about marriage? What is the same thing? Finances. What does the word say about finances? What does the word say? The more I raise in my children. What does the word say about raising my children? I want better children. What does the Lord? And the more you seek the information, what did I say? The entrance of the word brings what? Light. So the more you engage and you're looking for the word to give you doctrine. Because I know whenever we hear the word doctrine, we think dogmatic, legalism. Mm. But doctrine is, we've been saying this for the past three, four weeks. Doctrine is needful. That is the first process that the word works in your life. Doctrine. Giving you information. Giving you knowledge. Rejecting that knowledge leads to destruction. All right. What's the second one that we said is up there? Pastor, can you show the chart again? It's what? Reproof. Another word for reproof is rebuke. Bad word in the church. That's a bad word. God is a God of love. God is gracious. He's slow to anger. You shouldn't be rebuking people. The word of the Lord is profitable. It's useful. It's valuable. It's beneficial. It's good for reproof, which is rebuke. It's good for that. You get profit out of that. So, something is wrong with you. Hmm? You're, you're having these pains in your stomach. I'm using an example, somebody's um, example. Food can't stay down. Every now and then you're having diarrhea. Can't sleep, there's a burning, whatever. You take antacid. The doctor go, they prescribe this for you, that for you. After a while, you go to the gastroenterologist, the GI doctor. And he says to you, listen here. We can't just be hitting and missing. We need to see what's going on in that stomach. So I'm going to send you for some tests. W what's the point of the test? What is the test supposed to do? Why is he sending us for tests? That's right. So the test, he already got inf information. He got the information. Your stomach is burning, blah, 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 blah. All that information I have. Huh? But now I need to know what's the root of the problem. We need to see. We need to point out what is wrong. We need to identify what's causing these things. So I need an upgrade because I'm a very angry person. I'm always getting angry and I embarrass myself and I go on. A, I need an upgrade from that. All right. So the upgrade is not just going to happen because I pray and say, Lord, take away the spirit of anger. Not going to happen. We need to understand what is the root of this thing. What's causing it? Hmm? The word of God, it reproves. What does reprove mean? It means... That it convicts you of sin by pointing out what's wrong. It points out where you're going wrong. It points out what's wrong in your life. It points out what errors are in your life. It points out what mistakes you are making. Mm -hmm. What else? It shows you 
you're wrong. It exposes you and your rebellion. That's what reproof means. Another word for reproof is conviction. It convicts, it convicts you. So the word is not only a teacher, but the word is a reprover, a rebuker, a convictor. So when I'm engaging in the word, first stage, I'm getting information. The more I engage is the more it shines light on me. On me. So I can understand. So I go back to the first example I had. Preach the word. Be instant in season. Out of season. Ouch. I only preach when certain people, a certain amount of people come to church. If it's only two people, I change the service to a prayer meeting because, you know, I can't preach to two people. It's two people. Waste of time. Waste of time. But as I read the word, what is it doing? It's pointing out to me. It's not only giving me information, but now we're moving from just having information to now the information becomes a diagnostic. The same information that was just knowledge yesterday when I read it today, it points out to me, you're rebellious in that area. You've been doing that. That's a mistake. That, that's an error you've been walking in. Mm -hmm. It points out. It rebukes me. It convicts me of sin. Mm -hmm. Can you see how just having only the informative function will not bring me to an upgrade? Because if all I have is the knowledge, but the knowledge is not taken up, I said in order for us to upgrade, we have to remove some things and add some things. We have to replace some things. So if, if, if there's something in me, so I want an upgraded body, my stomach is acting the fool. Mm -hmm. I need to figure out what's going on in that stomach so I can get rid of it, not the stomach, but get rid of the thing. <laughs> so I can have an upgraded stomach. Yes? Many people stop at the information. We just want to quote scripture. We just want to know knowledge. We want to sound deep. But how many of us really allow the, the word of God to be like our x-ray machine? To be like the, you know, whenever I go to take my mammograms because of the nature of my breast, I can't do a regular mammogram. I have to do an up one, a diagnostic one. Because the regular one is not able to find what they're looking for if, they look, if it's there. So I have to do a diagnostic, a deeper search. One, that's, one that searches deeper. And there's some of us that the problem, why we're not seeing manifestation, is because the, the, we, a little bit of the diagnostic, we allow the word to, to, to search us a little bit. But when he starts to dig deep, we say, ah, you know the Lord is a Lord of mercy and grace. The Lord understands. <laughs> he doesn't really need me to know. He understands. I'm only human. And then we, we cut the word short from really doing the kind of deep diagnostics it ought to do to pull out the root. Because sometimes we don't get the root of the problem out, you know. We, 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 because remember I said the more you engage is the more light comes. And when light comes, it does what? It shines. It opens up the eyes of your understanding. It exposes what's in the dark. So if I only do a, a, a kind of surface scan... It, there are things that are deep down in levels, deep-seated things that need to come out that I would walk away thinking, oh, I'm on with the Lord. Manifestation going to come. Manifest and then when the manifestation doesn't come, you wonder why the word didn't work. You didn't allow it to go deep enough to hit those. So engage in the word. Engage in the word. If you realize you're being rebuked, dig deeper in that area of rebuke. So I realized the rebuke is you have not been instant in season and out of season, Pastor Alex. You have been a fear weather pastor. So I'm not going to just brush past that and run on to the next thing. So I'm going to dig in some more scriptures about being that fear weather pastor. So that the, the, the light, because the more I engage with the word is the more the entrance of the light comes and the more my eyes are open. So he can dig deep, he can search deep, and he can pull out what needs to be pulled out. All right, so reproof. The word of God is a what? He is a convictor, a rebuker. James chapter 1 and verse 22, real quick. James chapter 1 and verse 22. It says here, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgeteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, 
but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. What is this? It's comparing the word of the Lord to what? A mirror that shows you how you really look. If there's, we call them yampy. If there's yampy or cold in your eye, hmm? we call them what? Mouth bridle. If there's a white thing by your mouth when you wake up, mm -hmm, the mirror shows you that. If there's something stuck in your teeth, if your hair needs fixing, the mirror shows you that. He's saying people who don't, who don't allow the word to work for them by what? Taking what the word says and applying it to their lives are people who see the thing stuck in their teeth and say, oh my, that thing is stuck in my teeth. I need to get rid of it. And then they just walk away and, 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 and go off. Oh, oh my, my hair is a mess. I really need to fix my hair before I leave the house. And then they just walk away with their hair looking like that. And that's what, that's what many Christians do with the word of God. Oh my, the word of the Lord says that I should love my neighbor as myself. Hmm, you know, I really need to love Jenny better. And that's the end of that. Nothing happens. We, we just got the information. The doctor gave you this, the, the results of the test. Oh my, I have a lump in my breast. And you just move on your merry way. N nothing is done with it. It's like, what's the point? <laughs> you said, thank you and move on. What was the point of the diagnostic? What was the point of spending all that time going to the doctor and having a test? What was the point of reading your Bible? What was the point of coming to church? What was the point of going to that conference? What was the point of going on that retreat? What was the point? Mm, to burn time. And then you say the word doesn't work. You say, I've been praying for 10 years to God about this thing and I don't see any results. Because we're not allowing the processes to take place. Number three, it's corrective. So number one is what? Informative, like a teacher. Mm -hmm. The word teaches us. The number two, reproof. It's diagnostic, like these machines, these, these uh, medical imaging machines that we have that helps us to see what's wrong. It exposes us. It shows us what is wrong. It's a convictor. Number three, it's corrective. Mm? Now, the corrective here is not correction like rebuke. The corrective here is like... Um, Fixing you back, putting you back. So I, I, God forbid I got in a car accident and I was burnt all over. And they gave me reconstructive surgery. Or I fell out of a tree and I broke my arm, um, bone came out. And they're setting it back to correct it back in place. Someone was born with cleft palate. Yeah? And they do surgery to what? To correct it. So it's not a matter of rebuking. This correction is not rebuking. This correction is restoring you back. Setting you back straight again. So I love God. Hmm? That's right. I love God. He don't just rebuke us and leave us. He's not in the business of killing us. Huh? He wants a better us to come out on the end. So he gives us knowledge. He gives us information. He rebukes. He exposes us. Show us where we're wrong. Show us what's the root of the problem. And then he says, this is how we're going to fix it. This is what we need to do to put it back together again. This is what we need to do to get you back on the straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. It's almost like an occupational therapist, you know, those people who, when you have a stroke, they work with you so you can learn how to feed yourself again, how to write again, how to drive a car again, how to walk again. They, they, they are in the business of, well, that, that's coming further down later on. They're more the rehabil rehabilitative, but we're going to get there. I jumped ahead. But it's the surgeons are the corrective ones. So you got in the accident, the surgeon putting you back together again. And that's what the word does. The word is there to bring us into a place of restoration. A place where we can be whole again. So if I'm going to have an upgrade, I need knowledge of the word that's going to search me. See what is wicked in me. See what needs to be added. See what needs to be removed. See what needs to be replaced. Mm-hmm. That's the diagnostic. And then the word is going to show me how to do that. Mm -hmm. All right. So the corrective arm of the word is for correcting errors, correcting faults, correcting mistakes. I can never forget when we were much younger, uh, my eldest brother, um, he used to challenge when I said we grew up in a very fundamental home in terms of beliefs. Really? <laughs> He used to challenge my parents all the time about some of the beliefs that they, uh, some of the rules they had in the house and whatever. Because he would say, show me in the Bible where that is. And he was very adamant about that. If you say that, that, that it's God says, so show me in the Bible where it says that. He was very, he was a reader. So he, 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 he understood the concept of the word of God is 
for doctrine. It's profitable for teaching. It's profitable for information. And so he had, he had been reading the Bible for himself, but he not seeing where what they're saying is in there. He not finding that. So show me. My, my parents were gracious enough that whenever they saw that they had a teaching or a rule that they were told by their upper ups, the church bodies, that this is what the Bible said. And then they found out for them and said that that was not so. It was faulty interpretation. They were gracious enough to say, sorry, we're going to change that. That's no longer ruling the house. What were they doing? They were correcting what way they had made the family bent by giving us an erroneous rule or erroneous principle. And that's what the word of God does. The word of God looks at some of the things that we sometimes it's we have in our infantile baby stage of Christianity, we came up with some ideas that were not so. And yes, yeah, zeal, very good pastor, zeal without knowledge. And some of these things are actually hindering us from manifestation of things that God has for us. And so the word of God comes to bring correction to those things. He straightens us out. He sets us aright. He resets our direction and puts on, on a path again so as to improve us, to rectify where we are. Psalms 119 and verse 9 says, How can a young man cleanse his way? If I realize from my diagnostic that I'm going wrong, how do I cleanse my way? By taking heed to the word of God. Jesus said to some of his disciples in John 8 and 32, he says, if you continue in my words, because they believed his word in verse 31, we're told. He says, if you continue in my words, you shall know the truth. Remember I talked about the fact that once you stay engaging in the word, light is going to come. And the eyes of your understanding will open once you engage that word. He says, you will know the truth, informative, not only informative, but diagnostic, because the diagnostic is also the truth. The diagnostic tell me the truth of what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And the truth shall liberate you. It shall make you free. It shall set you free. It shall bring correction to your life so that you can have what? Freedom. You can be set straight again. All right. Last one. So the word is a corrector. Um, last one. Instruction in righteousness. No, this word instruction... The English word instruction would have fit better in the very first process, which is what? The information one, because that's instructive. But it's actually talking about instruction that has to be training. Training that has to do with discipline, as you would train a child. All right? So, let's start out. When I engage in the word, I'm getting information, I'm getting knowledge. This knowledge is supposed to be of a diagnostic nature. It's supposed to point out to me things that needs to be removed, things that needs to be added. Because it's not all the time that something that's wrong with you needs to be taken out. Sometimes you're lacking something. You're lacking vitamins. You're lacking minerals. You're lacking blood. So the diagnostic will tell me what needs to be removed, what needs to be added. Then it's going to tell me how I need to get that to be set straight. So it's going to give me information on how to do it. But me knowing how to do it and it being done is two different things, isn't it? Me knowing what correction I need, what I need to be brought back to restoration is different from me being restored. Mm -hmm. So the word now has what's called, I call it a rehabilitative component where it's now training you. Mm -hmm. It's training you and disciplining you to become or to live or to do that way. So for example, let's say finances. Let's say finances is my struggle. And this was instructive for me as I was studying it. Lord, I want to see manifestation in finances in my life. My finances need an upgrade. <laughs> How many people can say that? My finances need an upgrade. All right. So if my finances need an upgrade, based on what we learned tonight, I, it cannot be upgraded without a word. Yes? Because the upgrade is the manifestation. The manifestation begins with a word. So I need to begin to look in the word of God for the word the information, the doctrine about finances. What is God's doctrine of finances? What is his teachings? What is the information that he has available in scripture about finances? So I'm going to start to dig into that. The more I dig into that, is the more light is going to be shed, the entrance of your word brings light, and the more my eyes are going to be opened. He's going to show me some things that I'm doing wrong. And he's also going to show me some things that I need to do. Mm -hmm. He is going to bring some, some um, he's going to debunk some of the myths and errors that I have. 
That's the correction part of it. Uh huh. But then now, he is going to help me to gain discipline in what I should be doing. So I'm going to move from, this is what God's finances looks like. That's the informative section. The doctrine of finances. That's what it looks like in the word. But by the end of the day, I need to get to, this is what it looks like in my life and they match each other. You following me? This is what the word says it looks like. And in my life, this is, it looks like what the word says. But in order for me to get there, I need to be trained in that. So now, the word is going to train me in, when we said righteousness is, remember righteousness, the, the very short, right way of thinking, acting, and doing. According to whose standards? Who determine what's right? God's standard. So now he is going to discipline me to act right, think right, and do right with my finances. Not just occasionally, oops, I did it right today, and six months down the road, again, I did it right, and in six months, I'm doing it wrong. The word of God has that power to instruct me in righteousness, to train me in righteousness, so it becomes, I'm conformed to that. I'm upgraded, and when I consistently begin to look like what the doctrine told me, that's when manifestation happens. Are you following where I'm going? So the end goal of the word of God is rehabilitative. It's training my character. It's training me in the right way of living. It has already identified what's wrong. It has already corrected it by removing those things. But now I have to now walk it out and walk it out consistently. That's what training is. When we were... Um, when I went to teacher's college in Jamaica and then I also went to university and finished my degree in Miami, Florida, you had to do a semester of internship. And that's when we call it teacher training or teacher practice, practicum. Mm -hmm. Because they taught you the doctrines. Mm -hmm. You did some practice in the classroom and whatever you were doing wrong, the teacher would tell you, no, that's not the right way to do it. When you do presentations, you know, they pointed out some things that were wrong, whatever, whatever. They set you straight. And then now they release you in a setting where you can practice on the supervision, it's part of the training, what you learned, what knowledge you had taken in. If you didn't practice it well, you fail. You're going to have to do that practicum over. You're not going to get the manifestation. What was the manifestation you're looking for? The degree or the teacher's certificate, right? You're not getting that until you show over a consistent period of time. That's why you don't do teacher training for two weeks. They make you do it for a whole semester, a whole term. Sometimes they make you do it for a year. They want to see over a consistent period of time that you're able to portray or to demonstrate this behavior. So that when they let you go, they know it's likely that this is what you're going to look like in the classroom as a teacher. Yes? Same thing with doctors and whatever other um, professions. They have periods of training. And that's what the word of God does for us. He doesn't just show us where we are wrong. He doesn't show us how it's corrected, but we have a period of being trained in it until, that's, that's if you go back to the plant, the fruit start to bud out, one come out, but we don't have a crop yet. When do we have the crop? When over time we have endured, then you see the harvest coming. So these are the four processes that we need to allow to work in our lives. The rehabilitative property, and that's what I'm talking about, the occupational therapist. They're now teaching you how to walk again, how to talk again, how to hold the spoon again, how to comb your hair again, how to do the very things that you need to live. And that's what the word does. It moves you from just information to doing something with that information that's going to facilitate your upgrade and then bringing you to the place where you are walking out that better version of yourself, the actual upgrade. Then is when you know you upgrade. Verse 17 says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17, we're coming down to a close. That the man of God may be perfect. Why is all scripture given? All scripture is given for what? It says, uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. What was my word I said was doctrine? Teaching, so it's informative. It's given for reproof, which is conviction or rebuke, which is diagnostic. It's also for correction, corrective, and it's for instruction, which is training in righteousness, which is rehabilitative. Huh? When you're in prison and they're trying to get you rehabilitated, they're trying to train you to live in society again without crime being your modus operandi. 
right? So to restore you to what a good citizen should look like. Yes? So the word of God is now restoring us to what a child of God should look like. Mm -hmm. So every time we go through this process in the word, and notice I use different things, finances, marriage, raising your children, whatever the case is. Every time we go through this process, we get an upgrade. But guess what? We're not, I'm going to use the word perfect in terms of flawless. We are not perfect yet. We're not flawless yet. So guess what? Even though I've been upgraded to this version in my finances, if I start the process all over again, I can be upgraded to another version, a higher version. And then I start it all over again. And so what? I keep going from glory to glory to glory to glory, like Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. All right. So he says that the scripture is given and is profitable for all of these things so that the man of God may be perfect. This perfect here means complete, competent, proficient, and capable. Those are all meanings of that word. And thoroughly furnished unto all or every good work. Now, what is the difference between competent and proficient? Who knows? John. Uh huh. All right. John says competence, and that is so true, speaks of the basic minimum ability. So when I'm competent, I have sufficient to meet the job. Yes? I have the basic minimum requirements to do the job. But when I'm proficient, what did you say, John? Proficient means what? It suggests a level of mastery. And tonight I hope that I'm challenging folks not just to settle to be a competent believer. Or just to be, because that, that, that's one manifestation. And, and that's a good goal to have. I, I want to be a competent, I want to be competent in my finances. I want to be competent in my marriage. I want to be competent raising my children. I want to be competent in my relationships elsewhere. I want to be competent in my study of the word and application of the word. But don't, let's not settle for competence. Let's aim for proficiency. Let's aim for levels of mastery. I want to master my finances. I want to master being a good wife. I want to master being a, a mother. I want to master being a servant of God. I want to master being whatever and you fill the blanks in. Less, and that's what he says. He says, if you allow these processes to happen in your life, you will become competent and also you can become proficient, thoroughly furnished, equipped, ready, completely fitted out. For every good work. And that's where our aim is. The Lord told us at the, at the end of last year. In our New Year's Eve service. That this is a year for perfection and excellence for us. He's going to accomplish some things that he has started in us. But guess what? We need to be at a certain level to receive that. <laughs> Did you just agree? <laughs> we, we, have to be, we have to be at a certain level for that. Huh? Because if the things that he's promised us, if they're here, and my level of operation is here, it's not that he lied. They're there waiting on me. But he's waiting for me to do what? Upgrade, 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 upgrade. And once I upgrade to the level where he has it for me, it's guaranteed. It's already there. It's mine. So he is doing his part. Huh? By perfecting the things, completing them, accomplishing and executing them, my part is to be upgraded so I can meet the levels where they are. Amen? Amen. So I hope that we are being challenged tonight to be upgraded, for an upgrade. All right. We're coming down to a close. So, if the word we hear, the word we understand and believe does not provide doctrine, what's doctrine? Teaching, information. If it doesn't bring reproof, which is what? Conviction, rebuke, pointing out my errors, showing me where I'm wrong, showing me where I fault, show me where my mistakes are. If it's not doing that, if it's not allowing for correction, which is what? For me to be what? Restored, set back straight, put back on the right path. If it's not allowing for those things and it's not administering instruction in righteousness, training me the right way of living. Training me how to conform to God's will concerning this thing. If the word that I'm hearing and understanding and believing that is not providing all these things for me, then I will not receive the manifestation of an upgrade. I must have 
the word work in me the way it was designed to work in me if I'm going to experience that upgrade. All right. I must allow the word to inform me of God's ways. I must allow the word to inform me of God's ways or God's way of doing things. Too many Christians like to say, I. That's just how I am. That's what I believe. That's what I think. But I think that's how he's supposed to do it. So you know what? You know what? You just mind your own business and just let me. No, 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 no. We do not belong to ourselves anymore. We're not our own. I must allow the word to inform me of what is God's way. What is God's way when it comes to raising children? What is God's way when it comes to investing my money? What is God's way when it comes to like choosing jobs? What, what's, what's God's mind? What, what, what does the Bible teach us? What principles are in the word? What information can the word give me about God's way for that? I must allow the word to inform me of God's way. I must allow the word to give me God's doctrines. There's a doctrine for everything in your life. The word has doctrine for everything that concerns us. Hmm? It's not just the doctrine of salvation. There's doctrine for everything that concerns us. I must allow the word to point out my errors. I must allow the word to correct my errors. And I must allow the word to train me in God's way. Whenever I receive or hear a word, and I want this to become your homework that you're going to be practicing, you can take it off past that. Every time going forward, you pick up your Bible. I want you to ask yourself, when you read, no matter how simple the reading, I want you to ask yourself, is this thing, this passage I'm reading, teaching me a principle or a truth that will inform my thinking, my action, my motives and purposes, and my speech? Is this teaching me a principle? Because that's what doctrine is. Is this teaching me one of God's principles? Hmm? Is it showing me an error or a fault? Is it pointing out something that is wrong in me or in my environment? Because sometimes the thing isn't always inside of you. Sometimes it's your environment that has the error or has the fault or has the thing that's wrong that's stopping you from receiving manifestation. Is it attempting to bring correction to me? Is it trying to straighten me out? me right mm -hmm. or is it trying to train me and discipline me in the ways of God see this is how I determine whether I understand the word that I'm hearing mm -hmm. going back to where we started remember I said if you don't understand the word if you have a faulty understanding of the word then your manifestation is not going to happen so the word is coming to you and the Lord is trying to tell you, this is my principle on that thing. And that's not what you're getting from the word. You're getting from the word, the Lord is going to bless me and multiply me. <laughs> that's what you got. <laughs> when he's trying to tell you this. So let's say you read, the, you read the story of Abraham and Isaac. And you just fixated on the verse, in blessing I will bless you and in multiply. And that's what you take away from the word. And all week you're walking around quoting over here, declaring over your life. In blessing, God said in blessing, he's going to bless me. And in multiplying, he's going to multiply me. And I just received that. And for seven days, you're just declaring that over your life. Huh? Huh? Nothing is happening in your life. And you say, but I don't understand. They said to declare the word. You missed it. You, you missed it. The principle he was trying to teach you wasn't about blessing and multiplying. That was not the principle. The principle was about what? Obedience. Mm -hmm. sacrifice obedience even when you have to sacrifice you got it obeying God believing God taking God at his word mm? so because you totally missed the purpose of the word the word was trying to inform you of a principle mm? you went away with something else the manifestation that you are looking for is never going to happen not in this scenario here because you missed what the word was trying to work in you. You understand what I mean about making? That's why I'm giving you these questions to ask yourself. When I read the word of God, I'm not reading the word of God to get happy. I'm not going into the word of the Lord to look for what I want the Lord to tell me. I read the word of the Lord to hear what the Lord wants to say to me, not for me to tell him. This is what I'm looking for. 
What is he saying to me in this word? This morning I read this. Was he instructing me? Was he informing me? Was he searching me? Was he correcting me? Or was he giving me additional information that's going to help train me in a particular thing that we've already begun walking in? But I need discipline in it. I need training in it. I need practice in it. When you approach the word of God like this, then you approach it with understanding and that's when we can have deep convictions because now I have the Holy Spirit working with me because he understands I understand what I'm supposed to understand. And so I'm believing and I can hold on to that until the conviction comes. So it is this understanding that will produce manifestation of the upgrade in our lives. When I make use of the profitability of the word, where did I get that from? 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So when I make use of the profitability, it says it is says profitable full stop. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So when I make use of all of that, I will not only see fruit in my life, but I will bring forth a crop, a harvest, an upgrade. Bless God. Are there any questions on tonight? Are there any comments? Anyone who wants to share anything that maybe the, while I was teaching, you know, my, my principle, you know, my, I believe it firmly that while I am teaching you, the Holy Spirit should be adding to you to what I'm saying to every man according to what he needs. All right. So does anyone have a comment that they'd like to make a question that they'd like to ask something that they'd like to share an experience maybe that mirrors John no, just say that repeated. Okay, what I got from this was basically that um, what came to me was that sometimes upgrades, it's not always that the previous model was bad. Hold a second. Grace, do you have that extra mic? Because I suspect this is going to <laughs> be quite a bit for me to translate. <laughs> so John is sharing what he got, um, what he received while I was teaching. All right. Just, yes. What I received was that, was that it's not just that the um, older model was bad or that it didn't serve its job well. It's just that the environment around it changed and it required something different for the situation or for, if you will, the level that it was being in at that time, right? You know, for instance, if you had an older phone, for instance, you had an older phone that you had when I was in the fourth grade and that service <laughs> functioned very well four years ago it did it very did. well yes but you know the environment times changed what was necessary during that time changed since then and now it's not that you were bad necessarily back then or that there's always something that was <laughs> dear lord god yes. bad at the time <laughs> sometimes it's simply that you just need to adapt to the environment that's changing around you mm -hmm. so that's what i got and you need that upgrade to be able to function in and and one of um apostles big scriptures recently is what we're living in perilous times and if we are going to survive and function and be able to access the things that we need to survive in these perilous times we need to be upgraded because what worked for us 10 years ago like you said environment has changed time has changed and we need to be upgraded to be able to match the things that we are going to encounter in these times that's a very good point john Thank you for sharing. Tamira? Uh, a good example of how you upgrade or you can see that you're upgrading spiritually is when you go to scripture and every time you go to the scripture, you get something different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's, that's the, the Holy Spirit showing, uh, showing you, showing whomever it is that's going there. Yes, that the more you engage with this word is the more I'm going to open it up to you and more that I'm going to reveal it to you. So people who say things like, I don't understand the Bible. I, I can't, whatever. you're not engaging enough. Hmm? I always say start small and keep on. The more you go back to that one scripture hmm, is the more that you're going to get out of it. I can never forget um, this um, one, a man of God. He's very, um, well, he's well known now, you know, in Antigua, one of us, the sons of our ministry. When he first got saved under us, um, and I was a teacher back then. He used to say, um, teacher, he used to call me teacher acts back then. Teacher Alex, I don't understand. You can just read one statement, one sentence, and you get so much out of that one sentence. I tell him, you see, you don't have to do big. Start small. The Holy Ghost will give you a lot out of one sentence. But there are people who, you know, you, they're just wanting to prove that I can read five chapters in one sitting. No, you can't. What are you going to get? What are you going to remember out of the five chapters in one sitting? Really? 
you know, take it small. Start small. And like you say, every time you go back to it, the Holy Spirit, the more light is going to shine on it, the Holy Spirit is going to give you more and more. And then you're going to see, like you said, that, that, that evidence that you're being upgraded. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Anybody else before we come to a close? Apostle, pass the mic down, people. Please. Thank you. Gentle. <laughs> Calls takes time, calls for time, call for time and work. Yes, yes. Time in the Bible and work on yourself. Mm -hmm, if you mm -hmm. want to have an upgrade, it's not just going to be on the spiritual alone and neither is it going to be on the physical. Mm -hmm. But we'll have to work on both ends if we're going to um, get an upgrade. I like we'll that. We also have to work on ourselves, on our, on our mental our minds. minds, yes, yes. We have to make sure, as we read the word of God, we allow the word of God to change our minds mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that we can be obedient to do what, what he's we, uh, requiring. What, yes. That's right. Thanks for sharing that, Apostle. And that's the corrective aspect of it. When we read it and he shows us, we have to be willing, like you said, to put in the work so that the change can come. So that the change can come. You know, this, this idea that um, many in the body of Christ have that Somehow, once you declare a thing or you pray about a thing, it's going to drop out of heaven and happen in your life. It, it is a lie. It is a lie, from, it's a lie from the pit of hell. It promotes laziness. So people don't want to work. Yeah? Salvation is free. Your Holy Ghost is going to do it. No, he's not. <laughs> he is our helper, which means what? You have to be doing something for him to help you. You can't, somebody can't come help me do something and I'm not doing it. You have to be doing something for him to come alongside you and help. And Apostle, that is true. If we're going to get an upgrade, we have to want to put in the work. We have to put away this myth and this lie, this deception that Holy Ghost is going to do everything. That if I pray, it's going to drop out of the sky and boom, my marriage is going to be fixed because I've been praying about it. But what did you do? How, what, 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 did, what changed in your mind? What changed in your actions? What changed in your speech? No change happened and boom, the Holy Ghost. We're going to say, abracadabra, magician, magician. It is fixed. No, we, we, it's not a hokey pokey, you know, hoax and pokes thing. It is work. Hmm? The word works in us while we work with him. All right? In the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was God. All things was made by him. The word is a working entity. And expects us to work as well. Amen. Good job. I like your comments. Bless the Lord. Glory be to God. So we thank God and tonight. Hallelujah. For our teaching. Um, those of you who have been blessed. I thank you. Um, there were some of you who shared comments. Um, on Sunday morning. There was a sister. We had prayed for her I think. Um, and her daughter. Was it all years night? New Year's Eve night? Some time back. Some service back. And she shared a testimony saying that they both experienced healing. And I want you all to, um, you know, whenever we teach something that is of benefit to you, of profit, of you, profit to you, please share in the comment section so that um, others can be encouraged, others can know as well. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. So share in the comment section. All right. We're looking for that. That's an encouragement to us. So that we can be encouraged to keep on going. As always, Sister Tamira, as always, we are praying for you. Amen. We are covering you. Um, and you are in our hearts. So until we meet again, we are hoping to see you next Sunday morning, 1030, live here on Facebook Live for our morning worship. And next Tuesday night, we are going to be talking about the voice of the word of the Lord as we look at the rhema word and how I can see manifestation of the rhema word in my life. So may God bless you all. May the blessings of God go with you. May the peace of God go with you. May you strive for perfection and strive for upgrade in your life. May you work with the word and the Holy Spirit so that you can, in, you can see that upgrade. May God bless you. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. God bless you and good night. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen, amen, amen.